Um, hi, everybody. I'm Allison Bryant, the CEO and Chief Play Officer at Play Science. Um, and the next presentation is going to be my colleague David Bickham um, from, well, actually, I'm going to let you do your introduction. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, David Bickham. I'm an uh, instructor of pediatrics and a research scientist at Boston Children's Hospital at the Center on Media and Child Health. Um, and so we're going to be sort of setting the stage for the rest of the conference and thinking about, you know, how do we define the ROI of play? What are some of the ways that we can be investigating that? So for us, the I is investigation, um, as we look at all of our different I's in the ROI of play, um, and giving you some examples of some at least initial inroads that we've been making in the work that, that we're doing at Play Science with some of our partners and the work that David and his group is doing, as well as some of their partnerships with Hasbro and the more um, Play Today initiative. So um, we're going to switch back and forth a little bit as we go today. And I'm going to, um, are we, this should be up. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Give me a second. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to start off talking a little bit about about one way that we think about the complexity of play and all the different dimensions. And we call it, at Play Science, we call this the play matrix. And it's the idea that every kind of, of play or entertainment any platform, they all have a variety of variables, right? I always think about this as a research scientist. They always have a variety of variables that we have to understand in order to understand what the impact of that is, and as well as to understand even how to study it. So we look at six dimensions, and we always do think of this as a bit of a Rubik's Cube. So we think about the content that you're developing, the context in which it's being used, the audience that you have, and that includes all the different kinds of demographic variables, whether obviously it's things like, you know, basic stuff like gender and age, or we're getting into things like SES, um, you know, literally like location, things like that. Um, the platform it's on, obviously that's important, and that's one of those things that continues to make our matrix bigger and bigger and bigger as we get new platforms all the time. Form factor, so that's separate from platform. So for example, if we're talking about um, a touchscreen mobile device, let's say we're talking about a tablet, then on a tablet, of course, you've got video, you've got gaming and all of that. And video on a tablet is different than video on a smartphone, is different than video on a laptop, is different than video on a television, right? And this is a lot of the research that we do, and we have to understand that just because it's video doesn't mean that the experience is the same and the impact is the same and the, and the engagement is the same. And the last is what we call pedagogy. And this is that you know, there's all these different things that kids or adults can be learning or experiencing on these different platforms and in these different play experiences, but it does depend on what your teaching is to what's the best way to approach developing for this. And so we use this in a couple of different ways. We use this when we're thinking about, um, obviously, setting up research and thinking about longitudinally, how do you set up research initiatives that really are starting to aggregate insights across this. Um, the other thing is we use it when we're looking at um, working with our partners in actually developing products and sort of thinking about what are our consideration points that we need to. So I'm going to show you a little bit. This is sort of a, a visualization or a video visualization that we have of the place matrix to, uh, to bring this to light. Day long. 
the state of, of play and what does that look like for us? Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was just set the stage a little bit on what are some of the big areas where we feel like we have some insight, although we certainly always need a little bit more, and what are some big questions that we keep sort of getting all the time, whether it's from the more academic side of the research coming in, the industry problems that are coming to us, and that sort of thing. So here's a few things that we know, and these are not going to be lots, of, this is not a lot of specific little stuff, these are sort of big areas that we have some pretty good insight. So we know, for example, that there are many different modes of play, and that the type of play determines the outcome. One of the things we talk about at Play Science is we talk about the play spectrum, and that is very simply, if you think about completely open play, Right, that doesn't have rules or, um, or any kind of constraints around it. And you think about very closed play, um, where it's very rule-based, some of the things around games that are incredibly rule-based. Where does it fit along that spectrum? Well, where that is really defines how you set up the play structures, how you might have, if you're doing instructional design, how you might scaffold a child up through the learning experience, right? And we know that depending on where you are on that spectrum, it can have very different outcomes. And again, depending on which pedagogy you're trying to get to, you need to be picking your space along, um, about along that play spectrum. We also know that content counts a lot as does context, right? The medium is not just the message, that it really does just because you, know, you always hear about, oh my God, now you've got tablets, or oh my God, now you've got you know, this other screen that's in the living room. It's not just about that screen, right? The screen is just a window into whatever the content is or the experience is in that. And we know that from the research, right? We know that there are different engagement factors and different impact depending on what that content is. We also know that different platforms support different engagement um, and impact in platforms and also form factors. Um, and that pedagogical best practices that work in one area do not translate very often to something else. Whether you're talking about the classroom versus a mobile device, we see that a lot where people try to take sort of the, the pedagogical practices in a classroom and they try to translate them directly into, let's say, a game and it just does not work because it's not the right experience. Or even nuanced difference in form factor, which are things we've experienced in development, like you can have video, but there's a difference between a linear narrative video when you're trying to teach something to a child or have them learn something, and let's say a music video, right? Those actually have different, um, kids interact with them differently, and they learn from them differently, right? So it can be that nuanced within that. We also know that, and no one here is going to be surprised about this, but play, playful learning happens in both formal and informal context, right? Formal contexts are fantastic, and it's where a lot of resources are put, but the reality is all these informal contexts, which I know a lot of the folks in this room are spending their time in, also has incredible impact, and in reality is where kids are spending most of their time are in those informal contexts. And the last thing, and this comes from research that we did with the Toy Industry Association uh, last year around play, is that play is critical, and parents understand that it's critical, and teachers understand that it's critical, but it's not always prioritized. And all of the pressures that parents and teachers feel when it comes to success factors and all those other things that you know, they're, they're pressured with, play tends to get deprioritized, even though Play is often the way that their kids are learning these really important things like value systems or even just sort of knowledge acquisition and retention. So we have some space to move in elevating the dialogue and the discourse around play in the general public and even in things like the education system. So recess isn't taken out because we know that kids need recess in order to actually decompress and come back and learn um, back in the classroom. So we, and, you know, we have a lot of research around specific platforms and learning areas and all these things. We could definitely use more. One of the things that we're trying to, to figure out and want to bring out to the, to the group is, you know, how do we actually start to do a better job of aggregating these across all the spaces where this research is happening? There's amazing stuff happening in the academic world around a lot of these questions um, and some of the ones we're going to talk about next. And there's amazing stuff that's happening in the industry, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of space for there are, are ways to aggregate that information so that everybody has it. 
Now, what are some of the big questions that, that David and I have been seeing? Um, one is how do we assess the value of play in these harder to er uh, measure areas like creativity, resilience, long-term success, all those big 21st century skills and things that we know are the most critical for kids to have because the things that they're learning now or the jobs that are there now are not necessarily gonna be the jobs when you know in 10, 15 years when they come out. So how do we assess the value of play so that we can then you know, raise the level of funding and conversation and everything else in the space of play. The second is how do we understand time um, in play across platforms? So as we get all these different new platforms, how do, you know, what's going on with that time thing? Is it replacement that's happening? Is it integration? What does it actually look like if you're doing true cross-platform uh, play across a time period? Synchronous and asynchronous play, those sorts of things. Um, and then tied into that, what is the additive value of playful learning experience that extends across platforms? What is, and again, of course, it's gonna depend on the age and the, you know, the pedagogy and all that stuff, but what is an optimized experience, right? We talk a lot about, oh, we wanna develop our brand or our content, we wanna develop it across platforms, but what really is that optimal experience for your particular goal or aim? That's a big question, and it probably is different depending on what you're doing, but how do we actually even start to measure that, right, and really understand the value of cross-platform playful learning. And then, you know, how do we understand the details of a play experience at scale and context? This is something that David and I are gonna spend a lot of time talking about today. You know, you get big quant and you get smaller qual, and you know, big quant is fantastic and helps us understand, you know, sort of big ideas and how things happen at scale and across large populations, but the reality is it doesn't give us the nuance that we need to understand some of these other issues. So how do we actually aggregate those both, both of those perspectives into research and investigation in this space? And then lastly, you know, is digital play play in the way that we have experienced, you know, play in sort of non-digital formats and analog formats, and do different types of different play have digital effects? So again, these are just some of the questions that we we're coming up with as, as big ones that are coming up to us every day. One of the things that we'd like to do in setting the stage for the rest of the conference is to actually have you folks work with us to sort of put together what are some of the biggest questions that you have on the ROI of play. And so what we've done is we've got a, a Twitter feed, which we're not, gonna, we're not gonna keep up during our presentation because we've learned our lesson on that. No one's gonna pay attention to what we say, but we are aggregating it. We're gonna show it at the end, but we're gonna be having it run through the entire conference. And one of the things that is gonna be an outcome of the conference is we are actually gonna aggregate all of those questions thematically and sort of in, in some way, probably in some kind of six dimensional matrix and I'm gonna have to figure out how the hell to get back out. Um, but we wanna aggregate all that and then we're gonna send it back out to everyone that was at the conference. And what we wanna do is sort of show you guys what are the big questions that some of the leaders in play across these platforms and all these areas, what are the big questions that other people are having? And our hope is that you know over time we can use that as really a research agenda you know, sort of a collaborative research agenda that will move the play space forward. So use the hashtag uh, ROI of play. Yes, please also hashtag it Sandbox 2016. Um, if you forget to, we'll retweet it on Sandbox, so don't worry about it. But that's going to, we're gonna use that ROI of play Twitter um, stream to collate all of the big questions you guys have around the ROI of play. And if you don't have a Twitter account, just find someone in the play science team and, and they'll, they'll tweet up your question um, for you, so we make sure we get it up there. So, you know, I was just talking a little bit about this, and I'm about to turn it over to, to David to give some examples of some of the great work they've been doing. Um, but, you know, again, these are some of the dynamics or the dichotomies we're struggling with right now. I mentioned the small and qual versus the large and quant. The very highly contextualized research, right, where people are deep diving in one context versus research that's actually generalizable across populations, and particularly across cultures, right, and sort of a lot of the cultural dynamics. And then we have this issue of there's really amazing stuff happening inside the industry, which is obviously very internal and often um, you know, held, held under close guard, um, and the awesome academic stuff, which is technically is out there, although often it's kind of stuck in journals, which you also have to subscribe to. Um, but it's very methodical and it's really detailed, but it also takes you know three to five to six to 10 times the amount of time that it does to do the industry research. So when we're talking in some of the, the, the high um, innovation spaces where stuff is happening so quickly, it's very hard in some of this really great academic um, research to keep up the pace.
So I'm going to turn it over to David for a little bit to uh, talk a little bit about their More Play Today initiative and some of the really great work they've been doing in thinking about how do we approach some of these questions uh, with really innovative methodologies. Yeah, that was that was great because a lot of those are a lot of the questions that I'm going to repeat a little bit that we have been struggling with. Uh, how do we, you know, the, the questions that have come up and the methodologies that we've been designing to try to address some of those questions. So I want to talk a little bit about us. Um, I'm from um, the Center on Media and Child Health, which is abbreviated to CMCH. Um, we're a, a research education outreach center at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, our mission is to educate and empower children and caregivers to create and consume media in ways that optimize children's health. And we do this through research, which is what I do, translation and outreach, and, and innovation. And about a year ago, uh, some folks from, from Hasbro came in and, and spoke with us and described some of their conversations with over 100,000 parents and um, said that during these many interactions, it became clear that parents are eager for information about which play experiences promote positive life skills. Um, and their goals of um, gaining significant insight on navigating play in the digital age and sharing these insights to help inspire healthier, happier, and more, res more resilient kids. And we really uh, recognized that this was right in line with, with our own mission, uh, and we've been actually dancing on the edge of, of play for quite some time because we make recommendations to parents that often involve how do you balance um, play with digital media in the lives of your kids. And so we set forth on this partnership with our goals to um, figure out what's known out there, uh, review that, and identify places where we can contribute to this literature and this understanding, and then make some um, exceptional contributions to understandings for parents on the effects of play and child development within the modern digital landscape. So that's sort of the background for more play today. Um, and our overall goal here is to discover and share the characteristics of play that increase critical developmental outcomes and recommend which environments are most conductive to different types of play. So, you know, not small questions. And as we've dealt with our initial kind of delve into the academic literature, uh, what we find parallels really what Allison was talking about that the details of play really matter. And, and my work, my background is on media effects, looking at how media effects. Details and media effects matter. The exposure di dictates the outcome. What you're doing helps you learn what's related to that behavior. And that is parallel between play and, and media exposure. Context and content matter. But then this question just keeps coming up. How do we measure this? How do we, if we want to know this in the long term, if we really want to see it using academic methodology, how do we measure it? How do we, uh, how do we come up with ways to f answer questions like, how do time spent with playing toys relate to physical play? Who is a child playing with throughout their day? And what are the characteristics of that? play environment. And then, of course, what about digital play? And as Allison said, is digital play play? And when I think of that, I think about, well, we know there's, there's reams of literature showing the, the incredible benefits of, of traditional pretend unstructured play, uh, but not so much with this kind of play in terms of academic work. And what happens? When you go into the field, what you see is that people tend to talk about one or the other. And there's actually rarely uh, research that, that looks simultaneously at both play, video game play, app play, all types of digital play alongside uh, traditional, um, traditional types of play. And that's really something that we want to look at, see how those things are related. Do they interact with each other? Do they, do they supplement each other? Do they replace each other? Those are some of our big questions. Um, and then do different types of digital play have different effects? We know this is true with other types of, uh, of media that, that when they're educational and they're well designed, they have really good outcomes. And then how do families integrate their traditional play and their, and their digital play? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology that we, we've designed. Um, and it's based on methodology we've used to assess um, media use among, among young people. Um, and in this methodology, our, um, the parents are going to help us. They're going to describe, record, and show us how their children play. And we're going to be able to really see these details, who they're with, um, what they're doing, who, what they're playing with, and then also examine the details of the digital play as well. So we use a multi-method approach. 
um, that combines these different types of questioning and, and time use measurement. One is uh, recall estimates. This is just straight out questions. How long do you spend doing things? There's sometimes these are really these these are easy to deliver, and sometimes they're really they're pretty good. Especially if you ask someone about what their home environment looks like, these are a good way to get at that question. Um, time use diary, where they really record over at the end of the day everything they've done, um, and what's called ecological momentary assessment. This is using your cell phone to. Um, be the, the survey administer for, for the respondents. Your phone beeps, you look at it, you answer questions about what's going on in that moment. So there's no recall bias, you don't have to remember anything. You can give really good detailed description because it's happening right then, you can see it, you can, you can reference it. So we can get descriptions of details of play, we can find out, we can have them tell us what's the YouTube video you're watching, either the name or at least describe it to us. Um, and we can see the context that they're, um, that they're in. And we're going to be able to see that because they're going to do videos for us on their phones. They're going to show us using their phone what the, what the, what the play environment of their kid looks like. Um, these are my children. That's Mira and Xander. They're up there for two reasons. One, my kids are cute. There they are. The other, these were pictures I just took off my phone. Like, this is something, you know, not surprising. These are just things parents do. So the methodology itself is really... Um, very smoothly adapted by, by, the, by the participants. And then we're going to link all of this to developmental outcomes, including some behavioral outcomes of vocabulary, verbal me memory, executive function, and parent report outcomes about social behaviors and problematic behaviors. Uh, and overall, and then we'll take all of that, package it up into some outreach um, and with the goals of empowering, empowering pa parents about what kind of play is linked to these positive developmental outcomes and hope to uh, improve um, their children's development through these play. So that's the overview of more play today. Uh, it, we please, as we, as we tweet out um, ROI of play, check us out at the hashtag more play today. And our website at CMCH is cmch.tv. And we do have a lot of resources that, that um, I think that you'd be interested in. Our founder and director, Dr. Michael Rich is a pediatrician, and he has a column called uh, Ask the Mediatrician, which is questions from parents and teachers and researchers about media effects on children's health. Um, and we answer them regularly using um, a big database of research that we have so that our recommendations are all science and evidence-based. Um, and as we learn more from our research, they'll be distributed through those channels as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we do. You know, it'll in the keep keep watching, and in the next year, we'll be regularly releasing results as they as they come in. Yeah, fantastic. All right. I'm gonna. All right, um, and so now I'm going to give you one other quick example, sort of along the lines of what David's been talking about, of another approach um, with some similarities, a little bit of difference in ways that we've started looking at this cross-platform play question and sort of looking at some different methodologies. And, and we like to call it hacking and tracking. Um, you know, one of the big things we run into is that all these new platforms come up very often the methodologies that we've used in the past do not work. And I certainly learned this when I was um, inside my time. Uh, I used to work at Viacom for Nickelodeon running their digital research. And I would have people who were giving us the analytics, you know, these big companies, tell us that things like, you know, 60% of the traffic on Nick.com was adults. And I was like, mm, I'm pretty sure I'm using my brain and that doesn't sound right, right? But it's because the methodologies they had in place used just the primary computer in the household to gather the analytics, right? Well, that's what, not what the kids were necessarily playing on, right? So anyway, so, so one of the things we're doing is trying to figure out how do we actually fix all of this? So we're going to talk about one kind of approach that we've used when we're looking at cross-platform play. And again, trying to get both large enough data that we can start to look at trends and get some insights, but then also really deep dive in. So, um, you know, for example, we might combine um, in-home half-day ethnographies. Apologies to academics who refuse to call those ethnographies. You can call those interviews. Um, but in the industry, we tend to call those ethnographies where we're really embedding ourselves within a family. Um, and it's primarily to observe and not um, you know, we may ask questions every once in a while, but it's really there to observe what's going on in the home with regard to 
play, social interaction, um, you know, even including things like a meal time or things like that. Um, we would then combine that with, I'm going to skip to the third and then I'm going to come back to the second, with mobile randomized play diaries, which look very similar to the momentary ecological assessment, or, yes, <laughs> the, that the longer term um, that David used, which I find much harder to get our clients um, to get excited about. Um, but if I tell them it's a mobile play diary, then, then it makes a little more sense. But the idea is that over the course of weeks, so we'll have hundreds of families that are part of a study. Over the course of the week, they will randomly get a test message or an email, depending on their preference. Most families we find actually now tend to get a text message. They pull it up and they get three to four questions. So it takes them less than 30 seconds, typically, to answer the question so it's not invasive for them, which is actually a critical thing to actually getting them to answer the survey. And it might be that over the course of you know seven to 10 days that they're doing this, you know, eight, 10, 12 times. So it's not something that's going to be onerous for the family, but then for us, we're actually getting some really great data and we're making sure that over the course of the week, the time, you know, that there were, obviously we're not doing this in the middle of the night for them, although they certainly could be playing on the computer like RJ would be, um, but that, that, that we're doing it during obviously normal times of the day, but that we're doing it on weekdays, we're doing it on weekends, we're doing it after school because we know that the play patterns from a lot of our uh, their qualitative research, we know that the play patterns and the experiences are different depending on those kind of variables. And the last thing, and this is the thing I'm gonna the show you a little bit more on because David talked about the, the play diary piece of it, is something that we, um, we brought to our creative technologist on staff and we said, you know, we really want to be in homes. Uh, we don't necessarily wanna do video because people find video very invasive when you say I'm gonna like leave a video camera sitting in your home. Um, but people and families that right now are, are tend to be okay when you say that you're gonna take photos. And so what we did is we took, um, you know, sort of mid-grade, kind of 100 buck maybe, Canon um, cameras. And we wrote code that allowed them to take a picture every two minutes. And we then took those cameras and we used good Gorilla Grip tripods for the, that you guys who are familiar with those. And we put them in the main living room um, or living space or sort of family area in a home. Now obviously, yes, there's downsides to that and that it's in the main area. We didn't have it in every room in the house, but we were just trying to get a sense, in particular the last study we did this with, we were, try, we were, using, the, we were using television as sort of the main platform, but we were interested in what was happening with all the other platforms and experiences around television and family viewing experience, right? Um, and so that camera took pictures for two day, uh, every two minutes for, it was about a week, right? So we made sure we had both weekdays and weekends in there in dozens of families across the US. We then took that and I think my team is still recovering from this, content analyzed those photos for, you know, are people there? Are they actually watching, right? Is there something going on? Are they, what else are they doing? Are they multitasking? Are they playing games? Who's in the room? Like a lot of the questions that David brought up, we actually use those photos to go in and content analyze a stream for dozens of families over the day. And what was great was we were able to get, and this is gonna be a little hard to read, but really a whole range of different types of variables, right? So we were able to, obviously we had the demographics, we knew who these families were. We were able to look at the different platforms. Again, you're seeing this plate matrix come back up again. We were able to understand some of the context, what time of day was it, um, you know, what, what was there, were there other people involved, and then, um, through some of the qualitative, we were able to get at some of the needs-based stuff. So what I wanna do now is I'm actually gonna just give you guys a really quick, cause we're almost out of time, um, a really quick view inside what this data actually looked like when we got it back. And I will preempt that with the number one question that we get about this methodology, which is, well, A, do you see naked people walking across the room because they forget, you know, but 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 is it so is it invasive? Do do families, you know, do they know that the camera's there? And what we've seen, and you can see this in the thing, is that they typically, like around the like maybe the first day, you can see there's sort of a there's a recognition that the camera may still be there, but then they tend to completely forget this because they're sort of the way we have them set up, they're still there because we want to make sure that they you know understand that research is happening, but You'll see, they, they totally forget that the camera's even there. And when we contact them again and say, hey guys, remember, you know, we need you to send us back the camera. They're like, oh right, we had a camera there, right? That's good, that's what we want to get more naturalistic data. So here's what it looks like inside 
the homes of families. And how powerful that could be, depending on what your questions are. And obviously, you could set those up in, in different kinds of locations. I'm not going to lie, that takes a lot of resources to then go back and do, because each of those frames were then analyzed, right? So that takes a lot of resources to go back and do. But if you're really trying to get at some of these questions, I mean, you kind of have to be able to get into those naturalistic environments and get that, that, get that data at scale. So I'm going to end by just reminding you guys, please, as we're going to have some of the most I'm a little biased, okay, because we put the program together, but some of the most amazing talks and panels over the next two days, but I guarantee you they are gonna raise just as many questions probably in your minds as a lot of the insights you're going to get. So please, those questions that are about the ROI of play, whatever that I is, you know, that you're thinking about, please go ahead and tweet those. As I said, at the end of the conference, we're gonna collate those into sort of a, a deliverable back to you guys, and hopefully we can use that as a, a great space to create some dialogue. Thanks.